Be'ezras Hashem, with Hashem's help, we begin a new set of laws, the final set of laws in this sixth book of the Rambam. Hilchais Erchin Vacharamin. The laws of valuations, and Charamin, we're going to translate as dedications. Okay, it has a specific meaning that we're going to learn about later in the laws, but valuations and dedications. Erchin, as we're going to learn, means when a person promises to give the value of a person to the temple treasury. And although you might think that it, you know, we have to check out the value, the market value of the person, that's not so. In Erchin, we have a specific Torah set value. The Torah places a value on every single person, dependent on age. Of course, it's not about fixing his value. Human, human value is priceless. The point is the Torah makes or fixes a rate for what a person should give if he promises a person's value. That's called Erchin. As we're going to see, when a person decided to make such a donation, it always began with an appraisal. You had to go to the Kohen, and the Kohen would evaluate. You tell him your age, or as we're going to see, there are certain cases where it deals also with property. That had to be appraised. So Erchin also involves an appraisal. And they tell a story that Rabbi Hillel of Parich, one of the greatest Hasidim in Chabad history, he was even called at one point a half a Rebbe. That's how holy he was. He really, really wanted to meet the Alter Rebbe, the first Rebbe, the founder of Chabad. And it never worked out. Every time he came to where the Alter Rebbe was supposed to be staying, the Alter Rebbe would just leave. And it was clear that there was some spiritual element that you know, they weren't supposed to meet. One time, he heard that the Alter Rebbe was coming somewhere. And so he decided, that's it, I'm going to go meet him. He found out where he was staying. He went into the room that the Alter Rebbe was going to use as his personal bedroom and hid under the bed. And he figured, that's it. Now the Alter comes in, I'm going to, uh, surprise him. I'm going to surprise him. And I didn't say, but he had a question in these laws, in the laws of Erchen. And he figured that'll be the way that he'll open the conversation. He has a, a question in these laws. The Alter came into the room. He heard the, he heard the door open. The Alter walked in and he said, as a younger man, in Erchen, when a young man has a question in the laws of valuations, he needs to first evaluate himself. Reb Hillel heard that under the bed, he fainted. And by the time he came to, the Alter was already gone. So he never met him, but he heard him. And, of course, the lesson from the story is applicable to every single person. Sometimes we try to appraise others. Well, that's, that's the basic lesson, the Rebbe Azur of course. But the, the applicable lesson is that sometimes we look to appraise others, and really, it's time to appraise ourselves. At any rate, let's get into the laws themselves. So as the Ramam always does, he begins each set of laws by telling us which mitzvahs from the 613 we're going to be discussing in this set of laws. Says the Rambam, Yesh bichlalon sheva mitzvahs. There are seven mitzvahs going to be discussed in this set of laws. Chamish mitzvahs asay, yushtayim mitzvahs leisa asay. Five positive mitzvahs, two negative mitzvahs, vezehu pratan, and these are their details. Aleph, ladun be'erchei adam. The court is commanded to decide the cases relating to valuations of people. Kasher mefurdash b'tayra, as is explicit in the Torah. And we'll see later today. This is the law that governs the evaluations of people. Number two is the court needs to rule on cases of evaluations of animals. Somebody donates an animal to the temple treasury, how do you evaluate its worth? The law is relating to the evaluations of homes. The law is relating to the evaluations of fields. There's different types of fields. A person has a field in his, in his family inheritance. A person makes a field holy. Many different laws relating to fields and their appraisals. Hey, din machrim nechasam, the law of what happens to a person who decides to completely dedicate his property to God. Vav shalayi mocher cheyrem, these properties shall not be sold. Zayin shalayi goel cheyrem, these properties shall not be redeemed. And we'll define what those things mean. Ubir mitzvahs elu biprakim elu, the explanation of these mitzvahs is coming in the following eight chapters. God willing, for the next week, we'll be dealing with these laws. And then we'll conclude this sixth book of the Rambam. So the Rambam begins Perik Risha in chapter 1, Halacha Aleph. Ha'erchim, heim neder miklal nidre hekdesh. These evaluations, when a person takes upon himself to donate a per, another person's worth to the temple, it's considered to be a vow 
in the second category of vows, vows of consecration. Two sets of laws ago, laws ago in the beginning of Hilchas Nadarim, the Rambam said that in general, in Torah law, there are two types of vows. There are vows that bring prohibitions upon oneself, and there are vows of donations, of consecration to the temple. This book covers both types of vows. We spent the laws of the vows and the laws of Naziros talking about vows of prohibitions. Now we're moving on to one category of laws of consecration, of vows of consecration. There are other vows of consecration related to sacrifices. We're going to get to those in the Rambam's eighth and ninth books. But here, because the Rambam here deals with, in this book, hafla'ah, any uh, mitzvahs related to utterances, so he includes this set of laws here in this book as well. Shanemar. As it says, how do we know the Torah considers Erchim to be a vow? Because it says in the verse that introduces the laws of Erchim, it says, Ish ki yafli neder, if a person expresses a vow, la concerning giving the worth of a soul, of a human soul, to God. So what does the Torah call it? It calls it a neder. Erchim are called a vow. The fichach, therefore, because they're a vow, they're subject to all laws of vows. Chayavin aleyan mishum, lo yachil if a person doesn't keep this type of vow, monetary vow, he's liable on account of desecrating his word and not delaying to pay back a vow of consecration. He's also held liable for the mitzvah of you're supposed to do whatever comes out of your mouth. In other words, even though in this set of laws we're discussing the mitzvahs related to Erchim, it's a little bit more encompassing. Because it's a vow, it's also subject to all the other mitzvahs governing vows. You've got to keep your word, you can't delay it, and... If you don't keep your word, then you've desecrated your word. Halacha Bey is mitzvah saseh. It's a positive commandment upon the courts. Ladun b'dine erchin kasher mefurash batayra. To rule on the laws related to human evaluations, as is explicit in the Torah. What does it mean? A person's worth. The echad ha'emer. Whether a person says, erki alai. I want to give my worth. I take upon myself to give my value to the temple. Oy ha'emer erech ze alai. Or a person points to another guy and he says, I want to give the value of this guy to the temple. Or I want to give the value of Mr. X. He's not in front of him, but a third person. I want to give his value. The person gives the value according to the age of the subject of the vow. We don't look at the donor. We don't care what his age is. We look at the guy who's being specified. That's the guy whose age we have to determine. And based on his age, we decide how much he gives. How much do you give? You give the price fixed in the Torah, no less and no more. Because Erech is not a humanly based worth, it's a Torah based worth. Oh, what is the Erech of the Torah? How much does the Torah fix the value of people at? So we're going to have this chart to follow. And as a matter of fact, this is all clear in the Torah. In Parshas B'chukaisa, in the last portion of the book of Ayikra, the Torah spends a couple of verses telling us exactly how much each person is worth depending on age. So it goes like this. If the person that was specified as the value is 30 days or less, so we've seen a couple of times that according to the Torah, until, a person is, until an infant turns 30 days, he's not considered fully viable. And therefore, he doesn't have a value fixed in the Torah. If somebody were to point to a baby under 30 days old and say, I want to give this baby's value to the temple, it's as similar to saying, I want to give the value of this utensil to the temple. And therefore, you're not liable to anything, because the Torah only fixes value for humans, not for things. And until a baby turns 30 days old, it doesn't have that liability. Once it reaches 30 days old, so now it depends if you're male or female. From 30 days old until concluding five years old, in other words, till the fifth birthday. The value for a male child is five silver shekels. And the value for a female girl is three silver shekels. Once the child goes into their sixth year, until they reach 20 years of age, now the value jumps. The male child, teenager, is worth 20 silver shekels. The female, the girl and the teenage girl, is 10 shekels. 
Ad Shayashlim Shnas Shishim, from the moment they enter one day into the 21st year till they finish 60 years old, that's the largest period of time. The male adult has the value of 50 silver shekels and the woman 30 silver shekels. From the age of 60, beginning 61st year, until the day of their death, even if they lived for many, many years, they don't go down in value. The male adult is worth 15 shekels, and the, silver, and the female is 10 silver shekels. Now again, this is not fixing their intrinsic human value. That's priceless. This is the Torah letting us know this kind of erech, this kind of value. When do we count years? How do we determine what's years? Begins from the moment at the person's birthday till that moment the next year. In other words, we don't care about calendar years. We care about personal years. From your birthday till your next birthday when you turn one, two, etc. And that's how we decide your age. All shekels are determined by the holy shekel, the old shekel they used to use in the temple. Originally it was 320 barley corns. That's how they used to weigh it. They used to put in silver on this side and weigh 320 barley corns. That was a shekel. The sages later on added to the value of the shekel. They made it into a sela. As we explained in the Ramam's third book in the laws of the half shekel coin, that it's now 384 barley corns, not 320. Point is, this is called a shekel. So if we say that a person has to give 20 shekels, he has to give 20 times this amount. A person whose genital area is covered, or he has both reproductive organs, they don't have these laws of value. The Torah only attached a value to a definite male or a definite female. Therefore, if a tumtum or an andregenes said, Erki alai, I take upon myself to give my worth to the temple, or somebody else pointed to that tumtum or andregenes and said, I want to give their value to the temple, you're not liable to give anything because these laws don't apply to them. What about a goy, idol worshiping Gentile? He can be the subject of evaluation vow, but he cannot make an evaluation vow. What does that mean? If a goy says, I take upon myself to give my value to the temple, or I take upon myself to give the value of this Jew to the temple, he didn't say anything because he can't make the vow. But if a Jew says, I want to give the value of this idol worship to the temple, or he's not there, he's just talking about him. I want to give that guy's, that guy's value to the temple. Then the guy couldn't become the subject. You check out his age, and according to his age, the Jew should give that amount of money to the, to the Bishar Mikdash. The same as the. Yeah, same, same, same table. Same table. Similarly, if a person takes a vow to give the value of a deaf mute or an unstable person, mentally unstable person, chayav, you're still obligated to give that amount. You find out his years and you give according to his years. However, the Jewish slave, nerach v'oirich, can be the subject of the erech vow and he can make an erech vow. Kishari Yisrael, like any Jew. Now, of course, a slave doesn't have his own money. So how does he pay up his vow if he makes the vow? We wait. If he gets freed and he has enough money, he should pay up the vow, the value vow which he made. Since the Torah gives a fixed value, so we don't care about the quality of life of the person who the vow was made about. Whether you declare the vow about a beautiful person, a healthy person, or you declare the vow about an ugly person or a sick person. Even if the subject of your vow was smitten with boils, or he was blind, or he was missing a limb, or he has any type of blemish, all the humans are equal in this regard. You find out his age, and you give the money according to his age, as it's written in the Torah. 
everything we said until now was for the right side of the board here. Erchin. Erchin means, literally it means value, but it's a reference to Torah-based worth. Where we look into the, into the book and we decide based on his age how much he's worth. But then there's another thing that's called Damim. Hadamim, Damim means money, but we're going to translate it as market-based worth. Einon ke'erchen. They don't work the same as the Torah-based worth, erech, value. And therefore, if you use the word Damim in your vow, you're going to be paying a whole different set of money. Kate said, what would this look like? If a person says, Damai alai, I take upon myself to give my worth, my money to the temple, or I take upon myself to give the worth of this guy to the temple, but he uses the word damim, or that guy, I want to give that person's value to the temple, then we don't care about age, we don't look into the Torah, even if the person about whom you're vowing was a child on the day he's born, or he didn't have proper... Uh, Genitalia was covered, or he has both organs. Or he was a guy. You have to give his market worth. Dinar whether it's one coin or a thousand coins. The way you decide the market worth is you go to the slave market. How much will this person fetch to be sold as a slave? Again, it's not about deciding his human intrinsic value. That's priceless. But in this case, since you said worth, you didn't say the word erech. Erech is the Torah value worth. You said damim. So go to the market and figure out some kind of monetary worth. How much would he be worth if sold as a slave? Either way, says the Rambam, whether you're giving the Torah-based worth or you're giving the market-based worth, all the money goes where? Everything goes, if it's undefined, it goes to the upkeep of the Holy Temple. We're talking before the class. Maintenance is a huge budget to keep a temple going. You needed a lot of money. Here we have a picture of the temple structure. There's a lot going on here. And so, every money that was given as part of these vows went to take care of the temple. They should, all the money should go into the chamber, which was in the holy temple, Muchenes it was actually a designated chamber to hold anything that was consecrated to the upkeep of the temple. If a guy says, I want to give my worth. To the temple, or the worth of that guy to the temple. So if he uses the word erech, the Torah-based worth, we said before, he can't do that. It's worthless. But now he's saying market-based worth. Can a non-Jew make a donation to a Jewish organization? This is, a, this is, a, this is, this is the question here. So the Rambam says, the halacha is that the non-Jew who made such a vow can give and should give according to his vow. The only difference is the the money that he gives, we're not going to use directly to this chamber for the upkeep of the temple. We don't take donations from idol-worshipping Gentiles to strengthen the upkeep of the Holy Temple or even the upkeep of the city of Jerusalem. Shenemar, as it says, this is a verse from Ezra, when they came back up from Babylonia to Israel to build the second temple, some goyim wanted to take part in the building. What did Ezra say? Loi lachem v'lanu livnez bayis. It's not for us and you together to build the holy temple. That's our job as the Jewish people. They say even today, when it comes to a shul, the donation to sponsor the building of the shul should only come from Jews. V'nemar, it also says in the book of Nehemiah, v'lachem ein chelek utzdaka v'zikarin b'rushalayim. To you, the Gentiles, you have no portion, you have no charity, no remembrance in Jerusalem. So the first verse was talking about the bias, the house, the Beis HaMikdash. Second verse, Yerushalayim. So we don't use the guy's money for either of those purposes. So what do you do? What do you do with the money given from a non-Jew? So I think this is a fascinating halacha. We should ask the Gentile with whose intent did he give the donation? Who was he thinking about when he gave the donation? If he made the vow, having in mind that the Jews will do whatever they want with it. The court has the authority to use the money for whatever they see fit. As long as it's not the upkeep of the temple or Jerusalem. They can do whatever else they want. Anything the Jews need, they can use it. Just not the physical upkeep of the city and the temple. Listen to this. If the guy says, 
in my vow, I had in mind to give a donation to heaven, not for the Jewish people, for Hashem, you gonezu. You take the money and you bury it. It has a certain holiness to it. We're not going to use it for godly things, the temple of Jerusalem. We're going to put it in the ground and bury it. Halacha Yud Gimel, back to the laws of Erechim. Hagoises. If somebody is in his dying moments, taking his last breaths, he doesn't have a Torah value or a market value. Since most people who are taking their last breaths presumably will die, so he's like he's dead already. Similarly, if a person was condemned, his fate was decided in a Jewish court to kill him for a sin that he had committed. And as he's walking to be killed or whatever it is, someone else says, I want to give that guy's value to the temple. Or he, gives, he makes the vow himself, I want to give my value to the temple. Or the person says, I want to give my market worth to the temple. Or some other guy says, I want to give that guy's market worth to the temple. In all these cases, they're not obligated to bring anything. In this moment, he's in his dying breaths, or he's going out to be killed, he's like dead. A dead person doesn't have a value in the Torah's worth or in the market value. About this it says, in the Torah, Kol cheirem asher yachar amin adam. Any condemned person who is going out to be killed, lo yipade, shall not have a redemption. Kilaymar, this means to say, ein lo pidyon, there's no way to redeem his value on the Torah level. El harehu kimei, she's like a dead person. This verse is stated in that chapter about Erchim. And it's understood to mean an exception to all those laws. All the laws of giving the value to the temple don't apply to a cheirem asher yacharam, a person who is condemned. But if the person was going out to be killed, if he says, I want to give other people's value to the temple, or I want to give their market worth to the temple, or he commits damage while walking to the, on the way to be killed, he still has to pay. The And after he's dead, we'll, take, we'll collect from his estate. In other words, he doesn't have a worth. So he can't declare that I want to give my value. But someone, or, and neither can someone else say about him. But if he says about someone else, that's a good vow, and he's liable to, to, to give that money. Halacha tezvav, koyanim olivim, koyanim, and Levites. Ma'arichin v'ne'arachin kishar Yisrael. There's no exceptions. They're, they're like, like, like regular Jews. They can declare vows to give others values. Other people can say they want to give their value to the temple. The katan shehigi alo einas nadarim, also a child, as long as he reached the appropriate age for vows. This that Amram defined as they've reached barbas mitzvah, but they haven't yet manifest, manifested physical signs of maturity. The herich another damim. If at that age they declare they want to give the value of somebody to the temple, whether the Torah value or the market value, chayav l'shalim, he needs to pay it up because remember this declaration is a vow. Shari nadar of kayamim, and at that age. The child's vows are binding. As we explained in the laws of the vows. Halacha Tazayin, the Ramam repeats the point. When we talk about the table of Torah value that goes according to the years, the ages, we go after the years of the subject, the person who the vow is being made about, not the donor who's making the vow. Ketzad, what does this mean? If a 20-year-old told a 60-year-old, I want to give your value to the temple. He has to give the 15 shekel, the value of the 60-year-old. Mm-hmm. But if the 60-year-old said to the 20-year-old, I'm going to give your value to the temple, he gives the 50 shekel, the 20, 20-year-old's value. The same thing applies to all similar cases. Now, since this concept of erchen is a vow, so all the other laws of vow apply to it. For example, the person making the vow has to mean what he say, says and say what he means. Your mouth and your heart have to be of equal intent. Like any other vow. You can also ask a sage to be released from your vow. If you made a vow to give someone's Torah value or market value, like, you, like we would ask a sage to release us from any other vow that we make or any other consecration that we make. What if a person says... I want to give the value of all these people. 
everyone together. He gives the value of them all. Add up the total, everyone according to their years, and give them money. The Imhaya Ani, if the donor was a poor person, he can get away with giving the poor man's value to the temple. This we're going to explain later. Um, basically, what happens if a person promises to give a value and he doesn't have enough money to pay? So there are certain cases where the Torah says, all you have to give is what you can. Give what you can afford. It's called the Erech Ani. So the Ramam here says, if a guy talks to a group of people, he says, I want to give all their values to the temple, and it turns out he doesn't have enough money, so all you have to give is the poor man's value, whatever you can afford. The Amaya Asher, of course, if you were rich and you could afford it all, you give the value done by a rich man for them all. Give what everyone's worth completely. He says twice, I want to bring my value to the temple. I want to bring my value to the temple. Or multiple times he repeats himself. He's obligated to bring again and again for each one. Omar, shnei arach If he says, I want to bring two of my value to the temple, you got to give twice. He said, four, a thousand. You have to give the multiples of however many times you promised. The guy says, I want to give a value. He didn't specify the value of who. Just the value. You give the least amount on the table. What's the smallest number on the table? The female, 30 days between uh, 30 days and, and 5 years old. It's the three shekel, because he didn't say what, so we assume the least possibility. So the Jews and money always assume the least. Don't assume more than what they said. If somebody says, I want to give my value to the temple. Umes kaidem shiyamid badin, and he dies before he has a chance to go to the court. Now, why why go to the court? Because you have to go. If it was a person's value, you have to go and get your age appraised. You have to go to the coin, and he would have to you know listen to your age and decide based on that how much money you have to give. The point is, he made the vow, and he died before having a chance to get appraised. Ein hayershin chayavin litein. The heirs, the inheritors of the person, don't have to fulfill his pledge. Shanemar, because it says in the laws of Erchin that a core issue or a core thing that has to be taken care of in the process of giving the vows is you stand him up in front of the Kohen and the Kohen will appraise him. If he already stood up in the court, got appraised, and then he died, then the heirs do have to pay the pledge. But if somebody says, not the Torah value, the market value is what I want to give. Even if he went to be appraised. But he died before they had a chance to fix his price and say how much he's worth. The heirs don't have to pay. Only if they decided his money. And then he died. Then the heirs have to give. Why? What's the difference between Torah value and market value. How come when it comes to Torah value, we say that we don't have to wait for the, for the value to be set? As long as he went to the court, they have to fulfill the pledge. But if it's market-based worth, they have to wait till they decide the pledge. Well, the difference is obvious. Because the Torah-based value is set in the Torah. You have to only appraise him to figure out his age. Once you know his age, you know how much he has to give. But with the market-based value, you have to establish that price. And therefore, only if the judges actually establish that price do the heirs have to pay if he dies. Similarly, if a person says, I promise to give that guy's value to the temple. And both the donor and the subject of the vow die after he got to court to be appraised. Now the heirs have to pay because he already went to court. Were the subject of the vow to have died before he goes to court, even if the donor is still alive, he would be exempt. Because no dead person has a value. And the person who is the subject of the vow has to go to court. If he didn't go to court to get appraised, that's it. The, the pledge is over. And again, based on the, the rules before, if you would say, not erech, not the Torah-based worth, but the market-based worth is, is on me to give. The Ahmad Badin and he goes to court, Umeis Kaidem 
shikta to dama when he dies before setting the price, even though he went to court, but they didn't set the price yet. Hare is a potter, he is exempt. She ain't damim la mesim, because dead people also have no market worth, and if he didn't establish the price, no need to give. If they would establish the price, then of course the heirs have to fulfill it.